coming up next on Keys to Kingdom Living. Now the, the, the devil is starting to get your ear's attention and he will start telling you reasons why you can't afford to, do, to obey God. Now the true terror will see that they have rebelled against God and repent. I mean the true Christian, but the terror will not see where they have missed God. Are you hearing me? Why won't they see that they're missing God? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them to convict them that they have just missed God. But we have the Holy Spirit and he will reprove us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Will he not? And he will lead us and guide us into how much truth? All truth. But, but the false tear, the, the, the false Christian, will not have that witness within himself. And so he will go on in unbelief, and then when God tells him to do something else, he will say, all right, God, I will do this if. Now, Paul tells us in, in Romans 1, the just shall also live by faith. So as a Christian, it's not enough just to say I'm saved by faith, but now we've got to live by faith. Faith cometh by hearing. So that means intimacy, relationship with the Father. When we make this, the, this kind of decision to put off whether we're going to trust God or not or whether we're going to obey God or not, it opens up the door of Satan, for Satan to come and enter into your mind and then begin to pull you away, watch this, with vile passions. Vile passions isn't just desiring something evil, but rather desiring something over the will of God instead of the will of God. Well, I would like to commit to doing that, God, and I know you have, you, you've convicted me, constrained me to do it, but because I am not ready for that right now, I'm going to ignore it. You see that? That's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Choosing something other than what God is telling you to do opens up the door for that unbelief, and the unbelief opens up the door for Satan. Now look at James chapter 1. He deals with this, this uh, principle, this issue. He says, uh, my brethren, when you find yourself in various trials, you ever been there? He says, count it all joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith, the testing of your what? Faith. He, you got to know it's true faith. That faith is going to be tested if it's true, right? But let patience have its perfect, complete work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If you find yourself in this situation of various trials and, and you lack wisdom, ask of God who, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. So when you're in a trial and you just don't know what to do and emotions are running wild and thoughts are running crazy and you just feel confused, ask God to give you wisdom about your situation. That's what he's saying, right? So you're looking to God for direction and not yourself. But let him ask in faith. The only way you ask in faith is when you're engaged in what God is saying. You're not vacillating between doing what you want to do and what God wants to do. But let him ask in faith. Now, if a person does not want to do the will of God and they're looking for an excuse, but then they're confused, he says, uh, you've got to ask in faith with no doubting for one who doubts is like a what? Wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. There's no direction to a double-minded man. There's no direction for a tear. There's no direction for a false Christian. Are you seeing what the Bible is telling us today? But let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation and, and the rich in his humiliation because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. So we've got to learn how to, to trust in God, lean not to our own understanding, and then he will direct our paths. Now, James defines faith as being decisive when God speaks wisdom into our life. He shows you the way, and you do it. Abraham got up early. But if you love the world to the point that you struggle between the lust of this world, doing what you want to, and God's will, then you won't receive anything from God. You ever been there? Don't raise your hand. It, you know you don't want to. You know it's a commitment. You know it's a sacrifice. But you also know God has told you to do it. So instead of doing it, you, you don't do it, and then you ask God for wisdom on how to do what you're not going to do. 
Now that may sound confusing, but it makes sense to us, don't it? Because we're really, we're playing games, mind games with God, thinking we're trying to pull one over on Him. But He says, all you're doing is deceiving yourself and open up the door for the enemy to come and lead you astray. He that knows to do good and does it not to him, it is what? Sin. Sin. So we must not love the world. We must commit to God and do what he is telling us to do or we open up the door to double-mindedness and we won't receive any wisdom from God. This is why we're seeing a lot of confusion in the body of Christ among leaders. We're seeing a lot of confusion in, the, in America among political leaders. They're not seeking God, they're not humbling themselves, and they're not wanting to do what God said. And when you don't do what God says, then it allows confusion to come in and there will be no clear direction and you will inevitably do the wrong thing trying to fix the thing that you got wrong. God help us. And so the Lord is showing us we've got to trust in God. We've got to activate our faith and do what he's telling us or we open up the door for the enemy to come in. Now... Look there in Hebrews 3, 7. I don't want to get so deep into this that you miss the point of it, so let's move on. Look there in Hebrews 3, 7. Did God deliver his people out of the land of bondage in Egypt? He was faithful, wasn't he? Did he give them water and uh, food? Yes. He provided their every need, did he not? Their sandals did not wear out for 40 years. Their clothes did not wear out. He was faithful. Now watch what he says here. But although he, he delivered them, although he took care of them for 40 years, they never had lack, they still would not obey him. And these were his chosen people. Whenever you operate by unbelief, you say, I believe in Christ. I, I, I'm a Jew. This is back whenever they were brought out. I believe in, in Yahweh, Elohim. But you're not willing to hear and obey Him. Then there's something wrong, isn't there? Well, as a Christian, or quote Christian, when we say, I believe in Christ, but we don't want to hear Him, and we don't want to be committed to him, be accountable to him, then there's something going wrong there. We're missing it, are we not? Well, this is the problem that the Jews had in the wilderness. Look there in verse 7. Whenever the Holy Spirit dealt with them, here's how they responded. Today, if you will hear his voice and do not what? Harden your hearts as in the rebellion. See, that's what the Jews did when God spoke to them. They would harden their heart and not do it. See, that's what a tear does. When God really speaks to the heart, tells them to do something, they harden their heart and they won't do it. But yet they'll say they believe in Christ. Can I get a witness in this house? I said Wednesday night that politicians say they believe in Christ, but they vote to have abortion funded by government money that you work hard to pay into. They say they're Christians and they believe in homosexual marriages and they condone that and say that marriage is not necessarily between a man and a woman. It is a narrow mindset. It should be opened up to all types of gender benders. And you see now how we've gotten astray because people say, I believe in Christ, but they're not following the commands of Christ and they're leading an entire generation astray. And when God would command them to straighten up and repent, they harden their heart again. And they harden their heart again. And again, God says, repent, repent. And they keep hardening their heart. And guess what? We're out here in la-la land. We're so far away from the truth as a nation. It's like, my God, is anybody ever going to know what day it is? Look at, look at the signs of the time. And, and, and we'll, we'll defend them. Yeah, they, they went to Mass. I saw him in a synagogue the other day. He went to church. Yeah, guess what? Whenever the sons of God went to present themselves to God, Satan was among them. He went to church too. But they hardened their hearts. Every time God spoke to them, they hardened their hearts because they were in rebellion. Now let me ask you this question. Did they have the power to go into the promised land? 
Every one of them died in the wilderness not receiving the promises. So this is what happens at the time of the harvest, the Lord said. The tares will be known. Because they will not have the power to enter into the promises of the covenant of God. And then you will know the difference between a true Christian and a false Christian. How long, Elijah says, shall we halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then trust him. But if Baal is God, then trust him. Don't let's vacillate between Baal and God. God and Baal. Which one? Make a decision. Can I get a witness in this place? Read on. Now look what happened. Did these Jews have faith in God? No. What does it say? In the rebellion, in the day of the trial, in the wilderness, verse 9, where your fathers tested me and tried me. So they would not obey him, right? And when you don't obey God, you will always say, God, if you will do this, I will do that. Can I get a witness in this house? And so God would do what, what they demanded. Of, Give me water. He gave them water, right? Give us bread or we're going back. God give them bread. Did that change their heart? No, because the next time God spoke to them, they'd harden their heart again. And, and God says, I am, my goodness is with you people. Are you so blind by your arrogance and your sin and your hard-heartedness and rebellion against me that you can't even see my goodness? In spite of the fact that you have uh, murdered millions of babies for the sake of convenience and you have condoned homosexual uh, marriages in certain states and you've done this and you've done that and you've ratified things that got the word of God out of the society. Though you have done this, have you not noticed that I have sustained you? I have kept you as a nation. I have lifted you up on wings and I have bore you up. Though you have re bring reproach against my name, though you have uh, ridiculed me, though you have defiled my name, I have still been faithful to you, but your hardness has caused you to be blind to my goodness, which leads to repentance. And the children of Israel now, I'm not just preaching. The children of Israel were blind for 40 years to the goodness of God and never repented once. Well, they may repent. Repented, but they repented of the repenting and got back to their sinning. <laughs> Whoops, God, I made a mistake. I almost leaned on you for a moment, but I'm sorry. Now, here's the thing, America, nations of the world. You can play church all you want to, as long as you got breath in your lungs. But when the, when the rubber hits the road... And the end comes, and you play church, and you've done your own thing, and you said, I believe in Christ, but you've not committed to Christ. When, it, when, the, when, the, when the storm comes, you will fall, because only faith will stand. Everything else will fall. And the ones who's left standing are those who stood on the word of God, said, I shall not be moved. Now, they tempted God. They tempted him for 40 years, proved himself faithful, but, but the blindness would not let them see the goodness of God. And as a result of that, they could not ultimately end, end up, or enter into the promised land. He, he goes on to says, because they hardened their hearts, I would not let them enter into my rest. His rest was uh, exemplified there as being a land flowing with milk and honey with houses they did not build, vineyards they did not plant, wells they did not dig. That's his rest. Somebody else did the work and they just entered into it. Well, guess what? Christ has done the work. But we bought into this uh, get quick, uh, fix, sanctified religion in America that says you get saved, you get it all. But God says, once you've been justified, you've got to be sanctified. Come out from among them. Once you get justified and sanctified, then you can be glorified. But those who don't get sanctified, they ain't going into glorification. Because they won't handle the heat of the oven. Now look at Matthew 7, please.
So they chose, as Jews, they chose to walk in unbelief. They delayed obeying God and chose instead to do their own will and follow after their own vile passion. Therefore, God says, I swear my, my wrath, I will not let you enter into my rest. Now, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone, this is Jesus, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's sobering. But he who what? That doesn't say he who believes in me. It says he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many, not a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? There's the gifts. Cast out demons in your name. There's the power. And done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never. What part of never don't people understand? I never knew you because you never committed to me. Through obedience, through trust, right? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So all their prophesying, all of their casting out devils, all of their doing good in Jesus' name was in vain. Because it had a form, but it wasn't God's will. Now, there's a form of Christianity that has arisen in America especially in this decade, these last few decades, that is founded on unbelief. But it has no power because it doesn't operate on the basis of faith. Therefore, those who practice this type of religious lip service, is what Jesus called it, refuse to keep Christ's sayings and will ultimately tempt God with their lawlessness and will also have contempt for Christ. When you force these false uh, Christians... These false prophets, they will come after you. When you expose them, not by ripping their robe off and, and exposing their nakedness, but by you walking in truth and walking in the fruit of the Spirit, when you expose them, they will hate you without a cause. And this, is, this has got to happen. Jesus says they will, they will kill you thinking they're doing God's service. They will run you out of the temple and they will persecute you. Is what he said in Matthew 24, right? Now, the, the wheat, uh, the tares will, exemplif will not exemplify humility and submission. But they will be arrogant and tempt God with their wicked ways while calling his son Lord. Unbelief will always demand that God proves his heart before the disciple can step out in faith. Matthew 27, 39. I said all that as a basis to say what I'm about to share with you right here. Very important. It's life transforming right here. Matthew 27, 39. Jesus is being hung between two thieves on crosses. So they're, they're there. People are coming up to Jesus and they're ridiculing him. They're mocking him. And then look there in verse 39. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest, say that with me, the chief priest also mocking the scribes and elders said, He saved others him, he, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, look at it, they're tempting him. If you are the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will what? Believe. We will believe him. He trusted in God. Now they're just driving the nails on in. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. That is the main reason they nailed him to that cross. Because he made a confession of being a son. And, but here's, here's the kicker. They told Jesus, he says, you know, if you're really the, the king of Israel, then come off that cross. Do what we command you. 
Come off that cross and we will, we will believe in you. Now, it seems like a pretty good offer. Jesus came to save those who were lost, and these guys were definitely lost. So why didn't he just come off that cross to save those few scribes, Pharisees, and religious rulers? Why didn't he? Huh? He would have been obeying them, man, and not God. Now, had they come off the cross to say, and, and people will do this, but when they were in rebellion, this is just us now, it's just us. When they're in rebellion, they'll, they'll make the people in authority like the pastor or the boss or the parents say, well, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. But if you won't do it, then I ain't, I'm out of here. I'm history. So it, it, see this temptation? They didn't want to do God's will, which was believe in him as the Christ, the Son of the living God, although he has fulfilled no telling how many prophecies at this point in his lifetime. They still neglected the word of God, the law of the prophets, the law and the prophets. They, 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 they negated all that. And here they are tempting Jesus. And they say, if, you, if you're the king of Israel, come off of that and we will believe you. Now, everything looks fine at the onset, don't it? At face value. But if you think this through, if he'd come off that cross, none of us would have been saved. So that was a trick of the enemy to use those pawns to get to Jesus to tempt him to come off that cross and show who he was in the flesh. So Jesus says, no, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They're blinded by unbelief. Now, wait a minute, Jesus, you didn't give them a snowball's chance. You should have done something. You should have acknowledged them or something. No. You've got to read the rest of the story. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, that after his passion, Jesus came and showed himself to his disciples, and for 40 days he showed many infallible proofs that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the disciples knew that he was the Christ and did not doubt him anymore after that. Then go down to Acts chapter 2, where Peter is preaching. And as he is preaching... He says, you men of Israel, you who crucified the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to the same scribes, the same Pharisees, and the same elders that said, crucify him, away from him. But if he'll come off that cross, we will believe him. And, and they're on that same day, 40 days after Jesus has been walking with them. Now, I don't know about you, but it's one thing to say if Jesus came off that cross and his hands got healed up in front of me, I would have been pretty well convinced this guy's got power. Now, that would have really blown my mind. But for a man that I watched be pummeled to death to where his face did not even look like a man, and for him to wrap them, to take him off the cross, wrap him up in grave clothes, put him in a tomb, sealed by a Roman seal upon the tomb, for three days he's laying in there dead, comes up out of the power of that death hell in the grave with the keys and goes about 40 days doing infallible proofs that he is the Christ. Now that would tell me something. That would show me that this boy is Christ. But they saw him and they still did not believe him. So if he had come off that cross, and, and they still would have said, well, do something else for me. We'll do something else for me. We'll do something else for me. And they get down there, what is it, about Acts 2, 27 or so, and Peter is preaching. And they want to put him in prison. And they're arresting. These same hypocrites that said, if you come off that cross, I believe you. Not only have they refuted the cross, denied the cross, denied the, the burial and the resurrection and the 40 days of infallible proofs. Now they're denying that the power of resurrection is in Peter. Do not waste your time with religious people. They will destroy your ministry, they'll destroy your walk, and they'll spit on you when you submit to them. Every time. Preach it, sister. She's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. 
So we've got to make a decision today. Now, we've got to be aware of this demon from hell that has the, the two first names, political correctness. Because it's brainwashing a lot of people that are innocent, that do not know the truth. And it's causing them to believe a lie and be damned. And we're, we're so concerned about pleasing men and not staying on that cross that we say nothing about their political correctness that is, by the way, shutting down our amendment to free speech. We're setting idly by. So why is the church being so passive when the kingdom of darkness is being so aggressive? Why? Exactly. There's too much world. There's too, uh, let me put it this way and then I'll shut up. I get weary of preachers. They're on television. They're on almost every, inter on every station now, the ones I'm talking about, that says... Don't come up here and tell me uh, you all holy in that. It says, all of us sin. We all do things. Well, yeah, if you're not going to be obedient and you're not going to walk in the Spirit, then you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul told that. And, and they look down their arrogant noses at people that, that are truly hum, hum, uh, humble and obedient Christians and say, you're, you're pharisaical. You're holier than thou, and they condemn you for it. And they say, and, and they condone. A little cussing helps out. A little fornicating is okay. Homosexuality in the right context is all right. Come on. And, and they condone it. Because, after all, it's just a little bit. Then the Lord showed me a scripture the day before yesterday that changed all that for me because I, here I am hearing this junk in the name of God, and it's warring against my spirit because it's trying to convince me don't live that kind of holy life and sanctified life unto God because you can do other stuff and still get by with it. And Jesus spoke to me and said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I'm almost done. This father walks into his teenage bedroom, and he's got a box full of uh, drug paraphernalia and marijuana. And he looks up at him, and he says, Who gave you this? Who taught you how to do this? And the son looks up at him and says, You did, Dad. You taught me this. So when you allow a little leaven, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, in your heart, guess what? The children are going to eat it up, and it's going to spread like wildfire. Stand to your feet. For 2,000 years, people have wrestled with who he is. Embark on a journey with Pastor Asa Dockery in his new book, The Greatest Revelation, to find out more about the true identity of Jesus. Order online now at whcnorth.org. When you sow into this ministry with a gift of $50 or more, Pastor Asa wants to give you his latest audio series entitled Discipleship 101, Making Disciples of All Nations, and as a bonus, his latest book, The Greatest Revelation. Can't seem to find time to get into God's Word? Need an encouraging word at the right moment? Pastor Asa's daily devotions are available on our website at whcnorth.org. Use the Devotions tab and simply add your email address in the box provided or download the app for your smartphone. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 